So the two artists that we have speaking today um, have both gained international acclaim for their dedication and skill at creating art that engages the imagination and calls to our mutual humanity. Our first artist is Drew Kataoka, who has built a global following for her art, which often works to bridge the perceived division between art and science, um, and respond to a global need for more dynamic and interactive art. Drew has been named a young global leader and a cultural leader for by, the uh, by the World Economic Forum, and her work has been exhibited internationally at protests in forests and at the International Space Station. We're so excited to hear from her. So here to speak about the future of art, please welcome Drew Kataoka. Yes. Thank you so much. I have a video for you to start with. Thank you. Greetings, my friends. We are all interested in the future, for that is where you and I are going to spend the rest of our lives. And remember, my friends, future events such as these will affect you in the future. You are interested in the unknown, the mysterious, the unexplainable. That is why you are here. And now for the first time, we are bringing to you the full story of what happened on that fateful day. We are giving you all the evidence based only on the secret testimony of the miserable souls who survived this terrifying ordeal. The incident the places. My friend, we cannot keep this a secret any longer. Let us punish the guilty. Let us reward the innocent. How many of you know where this clip comes from? Does anyone know? This is the movie Plan 9 from Outer Space. It's widely regarded to be the worst movie in the history of cinematography. But what do the critics know? Hell, this movie has an awesome premise. I mean, it's about aliens, their ninth attempt to invade planet Earth, because, uh, you know, the first eight attempts failed. And uh, if you want to know more about this incredible masterpiece, you just have to kind of dig into it and watch it yourself. But we are here, as he so eloquently put it, to talk about the future, which is indeed where you and I will spend the rest of our lives, and to talk about the future of art. But first, I really want to put a shout out to Camilla and Celia and the whole Future Talks team. This is absolutely amazing. All of you guys are rock stars and everyone who's participating too, the delegates, the speakers, the community. Thank you guys so much. So does art have a future? Does, does art have a future? It certainly has had a glorious past. It's essential for what we call civilization. It's uh, driven our creativity forward. It's shaped our world. And it's given us things like Leonardo da Vinci, Michelangelo, and Picasso. Yet today, the art world is largely a subset of retail. You know, that whole thing about buying furniture and uh, designer shoes and handbags on the white shelf? It's pretty much the same thing. You go into a gallery and you see that spot painting that you recognize or that drip painting that you recognize and you take it back home, package it up, put it on your walls and your friends, they see it and they admire your trendy and luxurious tastes. Oh man, but Houston, we have a big problem. And that is, retail is dead. Dead as a doornail. I mean, you only have to look at the bankruptcies of major retailers and contrast that with the absolutely meteoric rise of e-commerce all the way from Amazon to Alibaba. So does that mean that art is dead too because art is retail, art is sold in galleries? Absolutely not. On the contrary, um, Art has an amazing future. It just needs to be reborn into new models. So it's just such an exciting time for art. Well, where can we look to see the future of art? I think it's not a bad idea to look at Silicon Valley if you want to check out or glimpse the future of anything. And that's where I'm based. Well, what are, what are the two things that we're starting to see in Silicon Valley with respect to art? Well, the first thing is that we're starting to see the disappearance of the retail model in favor of the commission model. And um, the second thing is that we are starting to see a lot of new genres and new art forms emerge, which are very deeply involving technology and not in a superficial way. So there's this big complaining, there's this kind of whining chorus that's been going on for years and years <laughs> that people in Silicon Valley don't buy art. And why? The galleries 
are really, really struggling. They're complaining to the media. This is Bloomberg. This is just one article. If you go home after this talk and Google it, you're going to just be swimming in articles about how people in Silicon Valley don't buy art. That's not true. Pe the millionaires and billionaires of Silicon Vi Valley are buying art. They're buying a lot of art, and they're buying a lot of expensive art. It's just that they're not buying it from retail. They're not buying it from galleries. And why is that? Because they People in Silicon Valley, they don't want art that's cookie cutter, um, mass produced, um, just kind of all, uh, kind of with this branded sameness. They want something that's custom made just for them, that's challenging, that's playful, that's creative, that's smart. And it's a very different mindset than the New York investor, the New York kind of finance people. They think of themselves as investors. They think about buying art as an investment, buying art as an asset, and as such, they love to um, cut the risk with standardization. Standardization is a great thing. After all, on Wall Street, there's this uh, famous saying, the trend is your friend. But whereas the New York people think of themselves as being investors in art, Silicon Valley you know, tycoon investing in art, he doesn't think of himself as an investor uh, in art. He uh, actually thinks of himself as a trend setter, not a trend follower, and also thinks of himself, surprise, surprise, these amazing entrepreneurs that are changing the world, these amazing venture capitalists, they think of themselves as artists. So this guy, who I had the pleasure and honor of knowing when he was alive, he said so many times in public and private that he was an artist, that the engineers that he selected and worked with, that they were artists, that his employees were artists. And the new generation, my, my friend Joe Lonsdale, incredible investor, serial entrepreneur, and uh, founder of the multi-billion dollar giant Palantir, he said, in Silicon Valley, things have to be elegant. We're a bunch of artists here. There has to be a beautiful solution. So they see themselves as artists, and as such, they want to uh, acquire things that speak to their own creative instincts. They don't want stuff that's just kind of ready-made. So they, they like to commission art, and they like commission art. So this commissioning of art. You know, how does it really work? Well, you know, I and a number of other Silicon Valley artists, we've built careers s fulfilling this actually really huge demand. We don't use galleries. We don't even use that many art advisors. And it's, you know, over two-thirds of the work that I do is commissioned artwork. And so, um, in Silicon Valley terms, we call that DTC, direct to consumer. And man, is it a win-win situation, because we're cutting out that big middleman in the center. So for me as the artist, the 50 to 60 percent that would normally I would give away to a gallery on the sale of the artwork, I'm keeping that. I'm reinvesting in the artwork. And the customer, the patron, they're getting a great price for the artwork. It's just overall, it's great unit economics. And at the end of the day, I'm not carrying inventory. Some of the artworks that I'm creating, just to fabricate them, just to start, they might be $100,000 or plus just to start fabricating that artwork. Can you imagine the burden on any business, let alone an art business, if you're, car if you're carrying 20 different artworks in inventory that are very, very expensive? It just doesn't work. So actually, this commission model, we've seen this before long ago. And sometimes to go forward into the future, you need to go back to the future. And who do we see here? The Medicis. We know them, right? They commissioned Leonardo da Vinci, Michelangelo, Botticelli. They cultivated and nurtured some of the greatest artists who brought us some of the greatest artworks of all time. In fact, it's not just the Medicis, but in the history of art, period, the greatest artworks that we have are, have, have for the majority of them, have been in this commission model, commissioned, uh, commissioned artwork. This idea, this notion of an art gallery is something that's super recent. I mean, we forget that it's like 100 years ago, we didn't even have galleries. So creating art for Silicon Valley, what, 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 what does that look like? Um, you know, I'm only one artist, but I can tell you about some of the works that I've been doing and some of the things that I've seen. Number one, uh, creating works that are really creative and then also if they can spark the creativity of the, of the patron, and uh, the community around that patron, that's really great. And the second thing is that we're seeing the e uh, intertwining in a fundamental way of the technology into the art, whether that's 
computer science or artificial intelligence or virtual reality. It's not something that's involved in a superficial way, but it's something that's involved in a fundamental way. That really goes over well. The first thing I want to do is now just talk with you about some of the artworks that I've created. I'm just going to share with you some of the work that I've done. I'm going to talk about this piece called The Tree of Pascal. You know, I thought that brainwaves would be a really amazing medium for art. It'd be almost like a new type of paint, if you will. And by the way, the device that we used to collect the brainwaves for this project was Emotive, which is revolutionary company, um, EEG company, and Olivier, who is here, is my friend, and Tan Lei, the founder of Emotive, also a very good uh, personal friend of mine. Um, so the idea of the Tree of Pascal, it was inspired I was inspired by Blaise Pascal, the great French mathematician, philosopher, and father of computer science. And he said, man is but a reed, the most feeble thing in nature, but he is a thinking reed. It's just an amazing concept. And uh, uh, I was thinking, what is the thinking reed for the 21st century? What is that? So here you have, in a nutshell, a digitally enabled ecosystem. Over 100 brainwa brainwaves from 100 people from all over countries all around the world are working in concert to keep one small tree alive. This is not metaphorical but it's actually literal. And how does this work? We collected the brainwaves over the course of the year, we aggregated them in custom software, they're connected to the electrochromic glass that is on the outside of this box that is in housing inside of it a very small tree. Electrochromic glass, depending on the voltage that you apply to it, either becomes more transparent or more opaque. At the end of the day, when people are thinking their hardest, the uh, brainwaves will make the glass go Transparent, light can go through, photosynthesis can happen, and the tree can live. As their thoughts start to waver and they start to think not as hard, we've calibrated it so that the glass becomes opaque. Light can't come through, the tree can't have light, and the tree will perish. The next piece I'd like to talk to you about is After the Celestial Axe. This is a piece that was commissioned for one of the big art collectors in his private forest of 600 acres of forest in California. This is not a situation where you like go into a gallery, open the door, and see something hanging on the wall. If you want to see this artwork, you have to be ready to hike for 20 minutes in sublime, immersive forests. And it's kind of an incredible experience because you're walking through dense forests. All of a sudden, you see something shining in the distance, something sparkling, something mysterious. What is uh, it that you're seeing? Well, I had this uh, concept that there was a celestial hax that was falling from the heavens that had come down and sliced this tree in 27 different locations, had receded back into the clouds, and left this frothy residue of reflective fragments. This is actually over two meters across, just this one section here, and it's very portal-like. It's almost very, a lot like virtual reality. You feel like you could almost just hop into it and teleport to a new world. It's highly interactive. It's this idea of artwork as a living organism. It's very much about the viewer co-authoring the experience by moving around. I see people, they go underneath, they go around. They love to take pictures of themselves in the work and the environment. It's, uh, it's a, they love to create kind of these um, derivative artworks, and the overall size of the piece is absolutely massive. It's, it's bigger than this space. It's like absolutely huge. I, next, I'm going to talk about UP, art that I created for the first Yale Gravity Art Exhibit at the International Space Station. Now, I've always been fascinated with speed. Uh, even when I was younger, I painted athletes, and I had the good fortune of having one of my artworks travel very, very far and very, very fast, 25,000 miles per hour to be precise, which is the speed that, according to NASA, is required to escape the Earth's orbit. Now, I created a, a, pa uh, a painting where part of the artwork was taken to the International Space Station. That space station. That's the celestial piece. And the other piece remained on Earth. That's the terrestrial, Earth-bound piece that never left the Earth. Now, we reunited the smaller piece with the larger piece, and due to the effects as described by Einstein in the special theory of relativity, the piece that went to space is now a fraction of a second younger than the piece that remained on Earth. So it's one artwork, two different pieces, two, two different ages, one younger, one older, the whole thing symbolizing this uh, conceptual portrait of father and son. And uh, now I'd like to talk about uh, some of my work in a mirror polished stainless steel. So I spent all this time developing this vocabulary of reflective fragments and working with mirrors and working with different reflective surfaces. And then I started working with mirror polished stainless steel, which, by the way, is a very technically demanding, very expensive material to work with. We, my team, ha we have custom engineered special processes and uh, special tools to... Can we play this video? There we go. We don't need the sound, though. So this, is a, this artwork uh, is actually commissioned for one 
private family in the San Francisco Bay Area. It's absolutely in the most beautiful location that I've ever seen. It, this artwork has now its own private cliff. It's overlooking the San Francisco Bay Area. You can see the Golden Gate Bridge. And this, is, this video is shot, oh, this is a little bit, uh, aspect ratio is distorted here. But this video is shot in a warehouse. But when you see the actual artwork, you see reflected in it pieces of the sky, the pelicans that are fly flying at eye level, yourself, the people around you, the cypress trees, the ocean, and all the beauty that you exp experience in it, it's remixed, and the next day, uh, it's, it's, it's gone. People love to take the photos in this work. The Ambrosia Wormhole series is my l one of my latest uh, series of works that I've been doing. It's inspired by astrophysics and Greek mythology. And I'm going to show you this video. Can we play the video? So the... Ambrosia wormhole is just a magic labyrinth of light and color, and it's just something that you really need to experience in person. And what happens, I just want to pause for them to be able to actually play this. You can see it. Can you guys play this video? Two seconds? He's good. Two seconds. So this is actually the first fully modular artwork that I've created, and there's all of these different planes in the artwork. And it turns out that there's different ones that are different sizes. This particular one has eight different panels, but you can actually configure those. It's the first fully modular artwork that I've built. So you can change the order, you can change the rotation, you can change about how backwards and forwards they are. And then, um, and, 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 and then actually, um, there's 338 million different permutations. I, they're, they're giving me signals in the back. I'm sorry. Okay, well, I guess maybe I will move on to the next piece. So, um, virtual reality. Uh, we're talking about the future of art, and virtual reality, it's the future of everything. It's the future of how we're going to work, play, govern, socialize, love, and therefore it's the future of art. And you know what? Virtual reality, it's not even a technology. Virtual reality at its heart, it's an art form. And it's something that is actually the realization of a, of a dream that artists have had since the dawn of civilization. And I should say, just before I continue, that along with my physical practice that I have been showing you of works that I create, uh, recently my studio in the last couple of years has been very interested in virtual reality. I'm working with both Google and Facebook Oculus on VR. But as I was saying, virtual reality is actually the dream that artists have had since the dawn of civilization. If you go all the way back to the cave paintings of Lascaux, what were those artists doing? They were actually creating a whole world, and then they were immersing us in that world. And if we jump up to the Renaissance and we go to the Sistine Chapel, Michelangelo is immersing us in that world. And now in 2018, we're on the precipice of this revolution where we actually can build whole worlds. We're world building now, atom by atom, pixel by pixel, and it's really amazing. So to turn down the sound for this, but this I just wanted to say that this is a little bit about my process. So when I'm actually creating a virtual reality, I'm shaping and sculpting natively in VR. This is a sp sped up video, but I just want to show you. I, I do that and then I write the scripts and I, I code and program up the way the world is put together. Uh, this is a uh, one of the works that I want to show you. The video doesn't really do it justice. You really should see it in virtual reality, walking around underneath and beyond the different pieces. You can teleport all around this world and move around in it. And you'll also hear your own heartbeat. And then uh, the last piece, it doesn't even have a title yet because you know art is something that's always in progress. It's always happening. And we were just working on this uh, the last week before I came here, but I wanted to show it to you anyways. My, my team jokingly is calling it multi-drew, but it really doesn't have a title. Um, so if anyone has a title suggested, they can tell me what they'd like to see. It's actually very haunting, especially when you're walking in it in virtual reality. It's the same person over and over and over again in different sizes, walking at different speeds in different ways. And uh, this is just the beginning. So we are, we, are, we are working on this piece now, and it's going to be developed further. So. Uh, 
just to wrap up and summarize uh, this talk about the future of art, I think there's so many exciting things uh, for us to do. Just even looking at virtual reality, it's going to be a space that requires so much imagination. We need kind of Michelangelo, Michelangelo, Leonardo da Vinci scale type of thinking. And I do believe that Silicon Valley is the epicenter of where this is going to continue to be invented. Um, but it's very, very exciting times, and it requires all of our participation to build that future together. So thank you so very much.